Good evening. I am Dr. Adriel Trott, Chair of the Philosophy Department, and I am pleased to welcome you to this year's J. Harry Cotton Annual Philosophy Lecture. The J. Harry Cotton Fund in Philosophy was established in 1977 to honor longtime philosophy professor J. Harry Cotton, who taught at Wabash College from 1947 to 1969. A fund was generously endowed by alumni of the college, philosophy majors and minors who took courses from Professor Cotton. The initial purpose of this fund was to establish the J. Harry Cotton Prize given to the senior who has done the best work in philosophy during the year and who exemplifies the qualities manifested by Cotton himself, humanity and scholarship in the liberal arts tradition. In 1984, the fund also began to sponsor the J. Harry Cotton Lectureship in Philosophy, which would bring a distinguished philosopher to campus occasionally. That same year, the first J. Harry Cotton Lecture was given by Gregory Vlastos, a scholar in ancient philosophy from Princeton University. Since that time, every few years, we have invited a philosopher to campus to give this lecture. Thanks to the generosity of our alumni over the last 40 years, we now sponsor a J. Harry Cotton lecture every year to ensure that philosophy is represented not only in the awards chapel, but also in the mix of excellent speakers and programs at Wabash College. James Harry Cotton was born in 1898 and died in 1982. He earned a bachelor degree at the College of Worcester and a PhD at Princeton and honorary degrees from Worcester in 1929 and Wabash in 1938. He left Worcester in the middle of his college years to serve in the First World War. While in graduate school, he was an assistant professor at Worcester and then pastored a Presbyterian church in Columbus, Ohio from 1928 to 1940. After taking his doctorate from Princeton and during his time as pastor, he lectured at universities and missions in India, China, and Japan. Before coming to Wabash, Dr. Cotton was the president of McCormick Theological Seminary in Chicago. One of his students at McCormick Seminary, Raymond B. Knudsen, who went on to become a pastor and trustee of Alma College in Michigan, tells the story of Dr. Cotton finding out around Christmas time that Knudsen's son was sick, calling him into his office and giving him a check to make sure the family had a good Christmas. This kind of humanitarian spirit is evident in much of his life. Cotton came to Wabash in 1947 and served as the chair of the philosophy department until 1961 when he left Wabash to be a department head at Harvard Divinity School. In 1964, he returned to Wabash from Harvard and taught here until 1969. He published three books, The Christian Experience of Life, Christian Knowledge of God, and Royce on the Human Self, and numerous articles, most notably in Philosophy of Religion and on Josiah Royce. In his 2014 presidential address to the Josiah Royce Society at the occasion of the 150th anniversary of Royce's birth, Professor John J. McDermott, leading Royce scholar, began with thanks to, and I quote, the earlier and influential work of J. Harry Cotton. At Wabash, Cotton taught a two semester introduction to philosophy course and is described by one former student as wearing tweed, smoking a pipe as he taught, often rattling off paragraphs of Plato or Aristotle in Greek. He was the president of the American Theological Society and the Indiana Philosophical Association. Dr. Cotton was a politically engaged academic advocating for civil rights, free speech for communists, anti-imperialism, and peace around the world before those things became respectable opinions. In 1933, he served as a delegate at the Ohio Convention to ratify the 21st Amendment that outlawed the production and sale of alcohol. His wife was an alternate delegate to the Democratic National Convention in 1956. Cotton served on the Presbyterian Church's Special Committee on a Righteous Peace in 1943, which was part of an ecumenical effort to seek a firm foundation for peace around the world. Cotton also served on the American Roundtable on India, which supported Indian independence from British rule in coordinated efforts with the NAACP, and was described in a report from the House Special Committee on Un-American Activities as a communist front. He served with the distinguished group of activists, educational leaders, and politicians on the round table, including Mary McLeod Bethune, founder of the National Council for Negro Women and an influential educator, 
Adam Clayton Powell Jr., the fourth black person in the 20th century to be elected to Congress, representing Harlem. Elmer Rice, the American playwright, and Mary E. Woolley, the first woman to attend Brown and the first president of Mount Holyoke University. I mention this remarkable cast to note the historical significance and radicality of the community with whom Cotton wished to align himself. In 1944, Cotton gave an address in which he charged students to consider the importance of liberal arts in changing the world. He spoke of an urgency of addressing the liberal arts to the issues facing our shared world that is remarkable from remaining so timely. He said, we are now beginning to understand that not only our political freedom, but our academic liberty is in danger, that the very civilization that has nurtured our liberal arts tradition is threatened that the world can no longer tolerate the luxury of Olympian aloofness on the part of its university people. In other words, the college must be aware of political issues. It must be stirred by the prospects of post-war unemployment. It has a stake in Negro slums and in the labor unions. If the liberal arts college persists in its treason, it will encounter the usual penalty of this offense, the death sentence. It is for the life of the liberal arts tradition that I am pleading end quote. It is in this spirit of humanity and scholarship that we are pleased to hold the annual J. Harry Cotton Lectureship in Philosophy each year. I will now hand it over to Dr. Gower to introduce this year's speaker. Thank you, Adriel, and good evening, Wabash. Uh, it's my distinct pleasure uh, to introduce our speaker for this year's J. Harry Cotton Lecture in Philosophy. Uh, the Life of the Liberal Arts Tradition Indeed. In Jason Reed's work in social and political philosophy, continental philosophy, philosophy, uh, and other areas, many of the characteristics and commitments that Dr. Trott uh, just mentioned with regard to J. J. Harry Cotton's exemplary life and philosophy are evident. Dr. Reed received his undergraduate degree at Hampshire College and took his PhD at the State University of New York at Binghamton uh, with a dissertation entitled The Production of Subjectivity, Marx and Contemporary Continental Thought. Uh, he's also author of two excellent books, uh, The Micropolitics of Capital, Marx and the Prehistory of the Present, Advertisement and the politics of trans individuality most recently. Uh, his article, A Genealogy of Homo Economicus, Neoliberalism and the Production of Subjectivity, which was the topic of discussion in my seminar this afternoon where Dr. Reed was a guest, has become something of uh, canon in the Wabash PPE curriculum. Uh, it was also uh, the topic of discussion in PPE 200 this afternoon. Uh, and Dr. Reed's blog, Unemployed Negativity, uh, ranges across topics as varied as monster movies in modern philosophy. To steal a joke that I heard was made in another class visit uh, that uh, Dr. Reed was engaged in today, uh, the title of that blog, uh, Unemployed Negativity, is a joke that students, you have to learn more about philosophy to get. Uh, he is currently, uh, I understand, teaching a course in the philosophy of work, uh, and uh, that will uh, be the topic of his reflections tonight. Uh, please uh, join me in giving a warm Wabash welcome to Dr. Jason Reed uh, for his talk, Working for a Living, Alienation and Identity in Wage Labor. Thank you very much. Uh, it's, I'm very glad to be here, uh, however, what, whatever being here means in this context, uh, but glad to see all your faces and honored to participate. Um, okay, so I am going to occasionally use screen share when I have some passages uh, to quote, and I'm a little bit, it's a little more technology than I usually use. I'm a infamously low tech teacher who just talks about books in a classroom, uh, but I thought it was appropriate given all the technological mediations. Okay, so thank you very much. Um, so what follows is in some sense situated at the intersection of two different philosophical inquiries. First, it is an inquiry into the philosophy of work, 
Um, and the philosophy of work, it may sound something like an oxymoron, drawing together the reality of life and the ivory tower speculation. Uh, the philosophy of work, as I understand it, does not so much seek a justification, a rationale for work, but moves in the opposite direction, arguing that work is so central to our social, economic, and individual existence that it structures how we understand ourselves, our capacities, and the world. In other words, following Marx's assertion that consciousness does not determine life, life determines consciousness, the philosophy of work is an examination of the way in which work contains its own spontaneous philosophy, its own way of looking at and understanding the world. Which is not to say that such an inquiry accepts the world as it is, affirming the knowledge it stems from work and the values we attach to it. The philosophy of work is a critical philosophy, but not a criticism that is articulated from above or outside the world, dictating how the world should be, but a criticism that follows uh, Kathy Weeks' suggestion in examining the contradictions, tensions, and aporias of wage labor as an institution of individual and collective life. Second, as I've already in some sense indicated, this paper is also uh, predicated on a philosophical reading of Marx that takes its starting point wage labor as the pivotal commodity and central experience of capitalism. It is a reading that draws together different stages of Marx's writing from the early focus on alienation to the analysis of exploitation that is central to capital. It is also a reading that is heavily indebted to contemporary philosophy most notably the work of Etienne Balibar, Pierre Macheret, André Tossel, and Lucien Sev, all of whom have returned to Marx as a philosophical rather just than just an economic or political point of reference. So to begin, I would like to begin to sketch out a definition of capitalism as both an institution and as the basis of our experience of the world. To start with, start with the opening lines uh, from Marx's Capital, Volume 1, the capital confronts us as an immense accumulation of commodities. The capital in some sense begins, or understanding capital begins with understanding the commodity uh, as a defining feature of our lives. But of course, commodities are not new to capital. Uh, as Adam Smith would argue, mankind has been bartering, trucking, and exchanging for a very long time. And com commodities and market experiences have, have existed long before capitalism. So to some extent, uh, beginning to flesh out this definition, we could say that Marx emphasizes that immense accumulation, that there's a qualitative change by the quantitative preponderance of commodities, that everything we eat, read, wear, watch, etc., comes to us as a commodity. But that definition, while necessary, is not sufficient. And I think that uh, uh, refining it further involves getting to what I want to talk about, which is that unique commodity called labor power. Um, and that much of Marx's analysis stems from the fact that in capitalism, the majority of people have to sell their labor power in order to survive. And that commodity, labor power, is both like and unlike all other commodities. It is like other commodities in that it is a commodity bought and sold on the market with a seller and a buyer. The worker wants to get as much for their commodity as they can. The buyer, the capitalist, wants to get what they're buying as cheap as possible. And once purchased, they want to get as much as possible out of it. The struggle over prices, over the quantity and quality of what is sold are in some sense no different than any other commodity. As Marx writes, uh, here we go first. Oh, I gotta go back. The capitalist maintains his rights as a purchaser when he tries to make the working day as long as possible and where possible to make two working days out of one. On the other hand, the peculiar nature of the commodity sold implies a limit to its consumption by the purchaser and the worker maintains his right as a seller when he wishes to reduce the working day to a particular normal length. There is here, therefore, an antinomy of right against right, both equally bearing the seal of the law of exchange between equal rights, force decides. Uh, so, their power is like any other commodity caught in a conflict over prices and goods. However, unlike every other commodity, Labor power is sold, but not exchanged. 
The worker cannot part with it since it is his or her body and mind that is now under the control of another, the capitalist or boss that dictates how it will use. The worker is positioned as an owner of a commodity, a layer of power before selling it, but once sold, it is put to work and belongs to someone else. Much of what Marx wrote in 1844 in his early manuscripts uh, in terms of what is called alienation or estrangement reflected this paradoxical status of the alienation of the self through the inalienability of labor power because the worker could not simply part with their labor power, leave their body and mind at the factory in order to pick it up 10 hours later. They were subject to the alienation of having their time, their thoughts and their activity belonging to another. Oh, I'm sorry, I did not mean to leave screen screenshot on that whole time. Uh, so, uh, but now I'm putting it back on. Um, so here's Marx on alienation. What then constitutes the alienation of labor? First, the fact that labor is external to the worker, i.e. it does not belong to his intrinsic nature, that in his work, therefore, he does not affirm himself, but denies himself, does not feel content, but unhappy, does not develop freely his physical and mental energies, but mortifies his body and ruins his mind. The worker therefore only feels himself outside his work and in his work feels outside himself. He feels at home when he's not working and when he's working, he does not feel at home. Now, uh, I should say that you know, a lot can be said about alienation. And uh, what I'm trying to do is not uh, frame this in terms of any discussion of species being or the necessary role in labor in defining oneself. I'm thinking this is not an alienation of essence uh, but an alienation of existence, a simple lack of control over one's time and one's activity that now belongs to another. Um, so the, the first contradiction I'm sort of working from in thinking about alienation is precisely the fact that it is both like other commodities and that there is a struggle over uh, its cost and its value, um, and it is unlike other commodities because once it is sold, it cannot be parted with. And these are kind of, you know, not fairly elementary points, but I think they have profound ramifications and it's the ramifications that I want to explore. Um, although the second and more meaningful contradiction or tension that Marx will detail when it comes to labor power is not that it's just unlike other commodities in terms of how it experiences, but it's unlike other commodities in terms of its economic function. Marx argues that labor power is the source of value of other commodities, which are but the expression of the aggregate labor time embodied in them. But more importantly, it's also the source of surplus value or profit because its price on the market and its productivity are set at different rates. The cost of labor, the wage, is determined by the cost of its reproduction, by the conditions that reproduce it and make it possible for the worker to return to the workplace day in and day out. Once there, however, its production necessarily exceeds its cost as the capitalist increasingly finds new ways of getting more productivity from the worker. What the worker sells is a potential, a capacity to work. This potential is um, I lost my place there. Uh, this potential is actualized by the capitalist, which gives it a particular task and objective. The capitalist enterprise of whatever form must necessarily take on the task of transforming what is potential into what is actual. The working day is structured to transform a capacity and ability to work into an actuality and to increase working power. The transformation of potential to activ activity is less a mystery to be contemplated than everyday reality that goes on so often that it's not even noticed which is to say that structure and experience are not the same in this case. The split between the two sides of selling labor power, of being both a seller and being sold, are manifest in a dialectic of autonomy and heteronomy. As Kathy Weeks argues, wages freed the worker from dependence on state aid and family support, wage work thus became seen as a sine qua non of self-reliance. Uh, this is what it means to work for a living, to find one's independence through the selling of labor power. 
However, this independence, and this is where I, Kathy Week stresses it's a kind of a poria more than even a contradiction, this independence comes at the cost of an often unacknowledged kind of dependence. First and foremost, as wage laborers, we're dependent upon the particular employer and their particular business. You know, if, they, if they go out of business, we lose a job. But this dependence extends beyond this to in include the entire technological, economic, environmental, and we could even say even uh, 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 environmental in the sense of, I'm, I'm thinking here of, of what we, we've all learned in the last year with COVID-19, we've learned that for many businesses to thrive and succeed, they're dependent upon the sort of overall status of, of viruses in the community, um, not a form of dependence we usually think about, uh, which is to say that as Marx argues, this process goes on behind workers' backs. Um, it is nearly impossible for any one person to grasp a way in which their simple act of going to work each day is dependent upon a slew of conditions that remain out of sight and largely out of mind. These conditions include the wage labor of others, the parent sell the commodities that one can buy with their wages, but they also include activities that are not waged, the care work, cooking and cleaning in the home that are necessary conditions of wage labor as feminist criticisms of Marx have made clear. The sheer complexity of the mediation of one's particular existence make it all the more tempting to grasp wage labor itself as an immediate act of making a living. And of course, that's how we talk about wage labor often. We talk about it as working for a living as if the connection between the work we do and the living we gain are direct and immediate rather than passing through the multiple mediations of the wage and the wage which buys commodities and the commodities which are dependent upon others and so on. And it's not just the complexity of the conditions of wage labor that are, are obscured by the wage, but also its relation to exploitation. As Marx argues, exploitation stems from the unique property of labor that it produces more than its costs. Um, as Marx argues that property, um, as he says, you know, between equal war, uh, right force decides, that property is open to uh, conflict in history. As Marx argues that the wage has an irreducible moral and historical element. Uh, in other words, the wages are in some sense determined by what workers are willing to put up with at a given point in time. Um, but more importantly than this basic fact of exploitation, Marx goes on to argue that one of the fundamental differences and in some sense, the fundamental difference between capitalism and everything that came before is the form this exploitation takes. The feudal peasant who worked partly on the Lord's land and partly on their own plot was acutely aware of the difference between the work they did for themselves and the work they did for their Lord. Their, their entire working day was structured on a physical and temporal break between the two. The worker under capitalism works both for their own uh, conditions, their own living, and for uh, uh, what, what Marx calls uh, necessary labor, the cost of their own labor power, and they work to produce a, a, a surplus. Um, but what is important and seemingly mundane is that there is no temporal or spatial indicator of the division between necessary and surplus labor. There is no bell that sounds or an announcement which states, attention workers, you have made your wages, the rest of the working day is surplus. Such an announcement would invariably lead to, at the very least, mass walk-offs, if not some kind of uprising. The difference between the cost of labor power and its productivity, a difference that is foundational to capitalism, is obscured by the wage that represents labor as a commodity paid for like any other. The wage relation is both the economic basis of capitalism and the kernel of its ideological justification and that it conceals exploitation behind an equal exchange. As Marx writes, all the notions of justice held by both the worker and the capitalist, all the mystifications of the capitalist mode of production, 
all capitalism's illusions about freedom, all the apologetic tricks of vulgar economics have as their basis the form of appearance discussed above, which makes the actual relation invisible and indeed presents the eye the precise opposite of that relation. And this is one of those remarks in Marx where um, he goes far beyond or far outside of what is usually considered ideology in the tradition of quote unquote Marxism, where ideology is some kind of superstructure that's apart from and different from the base. And here Marx argues that to some extent, the wage relation contains within itself its own ideology, its own spontaneous philosophy, and that its fundamental thing is that it presents uh, the wage um, as paying for labor power at its cost, obscuring the fact that built into the work process is the fact that all workers work for more, produce more than what they take back in the form of wages. So uh, the, in some sense, the wage is both uh, the economic kernel of capitalism and the kernel of its own kind of uh, ideological justification. The market, including the labor market, is one in which individuals are interpolated as potential sellers of a commodity, treated with the same equality as every other seller of a commodity, as Marx writes about the sphere of commodity exchange. It is a sphere of innate rights of man, of freedom, equality, and Bentham. All of this, of course, changes when we enter into production in the sphere where the worker is not so much the seller of the commodity, but the embodiment of one, subject to whatever its buyer would do to make it work, make it productive. These two sides produce a kind of split in, in the working subject. Uh, and then quoting from Pierre Macheret, uh, the condition for the wage system to produce all of its effects is therefore the worker has been put in the position of a divided subject, remaining entirely master of his labor power has alienated only its use, which supposes that this force can be materially separated from its use. As workers on the factory, restaurant, or retail floor, we are alienated, our time and activity belongs to someone else. But as wage earners, our labor not only belongs to us, but is a source of our individual autonomy and social belonging. So the split that, that Machere refers to is a split of being on both sides of this economic relation. When you're, when you're in the side of production, you are in some sense uh, the commodity that is being sold. As Marx writes, you know, you, the worker has nothing to bring to, uh, to the market, but they're hide and expecting a hiding. But when you're outside of it, you're in some sense a seller, a buyer, and in some sense inter uh, interpolate and address with a certain kind of autonomy. Okay, so this is the, the second part here. So um, moving beyond and expanding upon this contradiction between autonomy and alienation, recognition, exploitation, moves, means moving into the hidden abode, as Marx referred to as production, the labor process itself. Now, of course, the specificity of each labor process and the history of changing working conditions make it, makes it difficult to say anything about work in general. Despite the specificity, Marx offers two concepts to orient the way um, uh, the hidden abode of production work is understood. And these concepts are concrete and abstract labor. And this is, uh, Marx stressed right, that to some extent, many things we discussed before, labor as a source of value and so on, these were not unique to him. Uh, Adam Smith and Ricardo had said similar things, uh, but what Marx stresses is uh, that the, the dual nature of labor as both abstract and concrete is the secret to the whole critical conception. Now, of course, in Capital, this dual nature is, is first brought up to discuss the two different sides of a commodity. Every commodity is both a use value, has specific qualities that satisfy whatever needs, um, 
and every commodity is also an uh, exchange value. Every commodity can be sold um, with other commodities as a price. Um, to some extent, that distinction also can be traced back to Aristotle, the proper and improper use of every good. Um, but what I want to talk about here is um, concrete and abstract labor, not as explaining the different sides of the commodity, but concrete and abstract labor uh, as two different dimensions of labor. Concrete labor corresponds to the qualitative aspect. Uh, so the actual task um, of whatever specific job one does with its specific demands and constraints, the specific work of tailoring, weaving, waiting on tables, etc. While abstract labor corresponds less to the particular conditions of this or that job than the general conditions of labor itself, especially as that labor is related to quantifiable demands of productivity. These two sides intertwined in inseparable in the actual labor process. No concrete labor is done outside the general demands of abstract labor. And abstract labor cannot exist without being a specific kind of working, producing specific things, also constitute two poles for understanding its experience. Concrete labor is, of course, the basis of much of what we discuss when we discuss the experience of work, defining in some sense the constraints and conditions, frustrations and joys of the workday. It is the specific challenge of doing a specific particular job. At first glance, it would appear that abstract labor is outside of the immediate experience of work. The worker is focused on the specific concrete task at hand, while the abstract quantitative dimension, the average productivity, goes on beyond the worker's back in the reorganization of the production process and the adoption of new technologies. The individual as an individual is focused on their particular task, um, but their labor is part of a productive process that necessarily exceeds their understanding and awareness. However, despite being largely outside of experience and consciousness, abstract labor has effects on consciousness and experience. Demands to be productive or to produce at a set quantifiable standard are as integral to the working experiences as doing whatever particular task with its particular frustrations and constraints. Or, or we might say that, that what constitutes experience of work can be found in the intersection and contradictions of concrete and abstract labor. Uh, that is the intersection of concrete tasks and generic or abstract imperatives. The identity or non-identity of these two aspects makes up the experience of work. And these two different aspects can be considered in the way in which uh, wage labor is both a recognition and an alienation. In other words, it's possible to argue that both concrete labor and abstract labor have their own specific recognitions and alienations. With respect to concrete labor, the particular recognition is provided by the work itself, especially as this work has its own particular objectives and goals, it is a recognition of doing a good job. And many consider this particular satisfaction to be a kind of craftsman ideal, a craftsman ideal in the sense that it's often seen as unattainable to others who are not, you know, working and producing a very finalized product with their own labor, although I would argue that um, by and large, uh, most people doing any kind of work have some sense of what it means to do that work well. Um, even if the work is far from the craftsman ideal, uh, even work in the form of services, waiting on tables, people have an understanding and often are only able to get through that work by finding some kind of sense of satisfaction of what it means to do it well. Now, um, even though uh, one could argue that the tendency of work since, the, since uh, the inception of capitalism has been one of a division and fragmentation of labor that makes it harder and harder to maintain any sense of satisfaction over the completion of a particular task as those tasks are fragmented. Think, for example, of Adam Smith's famous example of the pin factory, it's harder and harder to feel job satisfaction when all you're doing is cutting the pins and can't even take pride in the entirety of the work. It's because of that, um, that some, including people like Hegel, um, have argued that uh, modern society has to have a different sense of an ethic and recognition through work 
and ec ethic and recognition through abstract labor itself. Now this, in some sense, uh, the idea of recognition through abstract labor sounds like even more of an oxymoron than abstract labor. How can this, how can one be satisfied in not just the particularities of their job, but in the sort of generic sense? Um, and as uh, uh, Hegel, I think, makes this argument most forcefully, um, the particular kind of recognition is the recognition of having a job. It's the idea that one is contributing to society no matter what one is doing, no matter how uh, uh, minuscule or uh, uh, divided or fragmented that work process is. Um, the ethic of abstract later is a recognition of both the general social function uh, of having a job, of making a con contribution, and the supposed autonomy and self-reliance of working. And I also think that concrete and abstract labor can help us flesh out uh, what we mean by alienation. In fact, they offer two very different and somewhat contradictory senses of alienation. With respect to abstract labor, the alienation stems from the gulf that separates the general demand uh, to be productive from the specific limitations of uh, one's own particular existence, of being a particular body, and other aspects of life. As Marx writes, uh, this is in the Grandrisa, about this kind of abstract imperative, um, contrasting it with uh, uh, pre-capitalist societies which did not know such an, an imperative and considered production to be subordinated to other extra eco economic concerns and demands like the demands of producing and reproducing good citizens uh, in the uh, Aristotelian case. Uh, Thus the old view in which the human being appears as the aim of production regardless of his limited national, religious, political character seems to me to be lofty when contrasted to the modern world where production appears as the aim of mankind and wealth as the aim of production. In bourgeois economics and in the epoch of production to which it corresponds, this complete working out of the human content appears as a complete emptying out. This universal objectification as total alienation and the tearing down of all limited one-sided aims as a sacrifice of the human end in itself to an entirely external end. And this is from the Grandrissa. Um, and in this passage, I think Marx gives a very different sense of alienation, one that is in correspondence with this idea of abstract labor. This is not uh, alienation from productivity, but absolute productivity as alienation. The more capital overcomes natural and cultural barriers and limits the productivity, the more it extols an ideal of productivity for productivity's sake that necessarily exceeds every norm and limit the more it alienates humanity from their finite limits, from the fact that one cannot be as productive and flexible as capital demands. And this is something that Marx writes about in the passage where he talks about capitalism, capitalism's invention of the 24 hour day and its need to overcome the limitations of the finite body, which can only produce so much, can only work so much in this demand to make productivity the measure of the human rather than the human, the measure of productivity. Um, but when it comes to abstract labor, we're in some sense dealing with the exact opposite. It's less an alienation framed in terms of the impossible demand to be productive than it is the reduction to the specific demands in dictates of a particular job individuals and particular jobs, particular lines of work are reduced to being nothing other than what that job entails. A life in a particular job or task constrains one not only to their finitude, to this particular body and mind, but imposes almost an additional fin finitude upon them, constraining them to be nothing more than what the job demands, making them into nothing but a dishwasher, waiter, or university professor. It distorts bodies, both in terms of how they are experienced, as people are reduced to the same actions, the same motions, and distorts how bodies, how these same bodies appear in the eyes of others. 
as Etienne Balibar writes, this process modifies the status of the human body, the human status in the body. It creates body men, men whose body is a machine body that is fragmented and dominated and used to perform one isolable function or gesture, being both destroyed in its integrity and fetishized, atrophied and hydrophied in its useful organs. Um, and of course, the inverse is equally true. As much as Balibar writes about the idea that some are reduced to nothing but bodies um, and seen as nothing other than the function of their bodies from their specific work, it also creates a uh, it's, it's opposite, men without bodies, the egghead or pencil neck bureaucrat. The division of labor produces an anthropological division of humanity as the division between mental and manual labor uh, becomes reified in the division between different types of humanity. The finitude of being this particular body with its history and relations is then overlaid with a secondary finitude that ties particular individuals to not only particular jobs, but ultimately to the kinds of human beings that uh, are suited to them. Uh, these two ethics are recognitions of labor, abstract and concrete, often reinforce and augment each other. The ideal of a particular concrete labor of completing a particular task is reinforced by its place within a society of abstract labor in which different and diverse labors reinforce and augment each other in relations of extreme. The concrete and abstract exist as two sides of the same process. However, they are just as likely to come into tension or even contradiction. The demands to make labor uniformly productive, to render it interchangeable, comes up against the individual ideal um, of a particular job and their own place and productivity in that. Um, so in some sense, abstract productivity is uh, in con contradiction to the demands of a specific job, and sometimes the demands of a specific job seem difficult to, to correlate or bring in line with demands to increase one's productivity. And to some extent, going back to this idea that what we call the experience of work is often framed between the contradiction between concrete and abstract labor. We can say it's often framed in the way that contradiction becomes incredibly acute as one feels that they can either do their job well or do it in terms of what is being asked of them in terms of standards and ideals of how much they should do it or how quickly they should do it. Um, a similar point could be made with respect to the two different alienations, the alienation of abstract labor, which is the alienation of being alienated in and through a demand for a kind of almost Promethean productivity and the alienation of a concrete labor, which reduces one to a specific job that to some extent these two uh, uh, alienations can correlate and come into conflict um, in the sense that uh, uh, sometimes the idea of being reduced to a particular job is how one is seen or made to be productive but sometimes the 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 abstract and indifferent nature of abstract labor, the demand to be productive regardless of a specific task, and especially and increasingly uh, the demand to, be, to fluctuate and move from task to task to sort of uh, carry oneself with a kind of abstract sense of professionalism that isn't reduced to a specific task, but is defined by its ability to move from task to task can be in contradiction with the alienation to a specific job or task. Um, so part of what makes this intersection incomplete and uneven is not just a split between abstract and concrete labor, or even the split between uh, their specific ethic or recognition or alienation, um, but also between the material conditions and, their, and its representation or figuration. Abstract and concrete labor are both an element of the labor process abstract standards of productivity and concrete task, and at the same time are representations of this activity. Uh, Marx makes this point directly when it comes to abstract labor, which is position, posited as both the process that goes on behind workers' backs and with it a new cultural sensibility. On this point, Marx is sometimes indirect and perhaps even cryptic. 
But it seems that partly what he argues is that part of capitalism's tendency to profane all that is holy, to dissolve motley feudal ties at the level of superstructure, stems from the fact that at the level of the base, it is indifferent to anything but the work of the worker, regardless of gender, age, or ethnicity. In other words, a certain idea of abstract humanity appears with the exploitation of wage labor. With respect to concrete labor and how it also fuels a particular representation of work, Marx is perhaps even less clear. Uh, he often identifies concrete labor in this division into different jobs as something that pre-exists capital, uh, something that's found uh, in the history of philosophy prior to capital. Marx cites here, of course, uh, Plato's Republic and the idea that each of us is is uh, different and each of us is better suited to a different job. Uh, and sometimes Marx also ties this to pre-capitalist societies founded upon um, caste. Um, but to some extent, um, both these notions, the notion of universal interchangeability and hierarchy and variability are in some sense part of the unstable image of humanity um, that uh, in capital that reproduces both a kind of indifference and flexibility as workers are put to work regardless of who they are and where they come from, but also a system which despite that indifference and flexibility still requires hierarchies and differentiations. So um, the division between the ideological and alienating dimension of abstract labor, that which forms the basis of a subjectivity and a sense of self and that which undermines and exceeds all subjectivity is not rigidly established. It cuts between different historical moments, different sites of labor and different individuals. Indifferent and abstract productivity is both the condition of, li of liberation, providing the basis for overcoming limits of gender, race, and the condition of subjection, providing a, a norm that few can live up to. Pure quantitative productivity is both a source of liberation and subjection. A similar point could be made with respect to concrete labor, which appears as both an ethic and an identity, a place in the social order, and a limitation and reduction to that place in its corresponding hierarchy. How they appear and intersect depends in part on the particular conditions of the labor situation, but also how and in what way these general characteristics of the division of labor are thematized and symbolized in a given situation. If abstract labor takes on a symbolic form as an ideal of universal interchangeable humanity, then the after image of concrete label Labor would be that of a hierarchy of different skills and abilities of humanity as differentiated at the different jobs available in the labor process. Uh, for the most part, Marx considers such divisions to be part of a pre-capitalist world, a world divided into caste and feudal orders. Such divisions are in that case still organized around the principle of use value and production is organized around the individual that becomes part of the machine. Uh, capital Man capitalist manufacture displaces with both of these foundations, its goal is the production of exchange value and is organized around the productive process of which the individual is just a part. It also functions without rational, rationale or justification, especially as it comes into conflict with the abstract interchangeability of individual workers. The actual history of capitalism provides an illustration of this tension as ideals of flexibility and indifference confront the reality of hierarchy and inequality. Reconciling universality and hierarchy often entails or demands a supplement, another ground for the, for the exploitation and justification of a hierarchy that cannot be justified on the basis of the wage relation alone. And um, this is why, you know, as many people have argued, uh, historically capitalism has constantly needed uh, recourse to ideas of uh, gender, race, uh, and nationality, divisions which do not or originate from capital, but necessarily are reinvented with it. Um, so, uh, to sketch out this picture that I'm, I'm, I've been trying to draw here, it's one of uh, uh, a couple different divisions. First, uh, 
as I mentioned at the beginning, wage labor has to be understood as the basis of both an alienation and a recognition. An alienation when one is put to work, but a recognition in the sense that the wage is the basis for a kind of symbolism of one's participation in society and one's autonomy as, as odd and, and apparatic as that autonomy is. Um, and then following that, that division, there's a division in labor between abstract and concrete labor, um, which in turn is divided that both abstract and concrete labor have to be seen as a continuation of this recognition and this alienation. There's a recognition uh, in abstract labor, a recognition that recognizes every human being as a worker, as in some sense interchangeable, as in some sense a productive member of society. And there's an alienation in abstract labor in that no one can quite conform to or live up to the standards of abstract productivity. And then in turn, with concrete labor, there is both a recognition and an alienation, a recognition of concrete labor in the sense that a concrete task gives one a place in the world, gives one a claim to know something, to be able to do something. Uh, that's its recognition. Its alienation is very often the case that the concrete labor that one is called upon to do is less than one is capable of as a human being, as a reduction to their potential and their possibilities into one particular job. And so in that way, concrete labor is also an alienation. And then, not to make this too complicated, I also think that at, with concrete and abstract labor, we are constantly dealing with both the reality of concrete and abstract labor, but also the way in which concrete and abstract labor uh, give rise to their own particular kind of spontaneous philosophies or mythologies. Abstract labor is the idea of a kind of fundamental interchangeability of all human beings and to some extent a fundamental equality of all human beings. I mean, this is the side of capitalism that Marx in some sense embraced in the Communist Manifesto, its tendency to do away with pre-existing hierarchies of ethnicity and to some extent even gender, its tendency to treat everyone as a worker and in some sense in doing so to dispel a whole series of pre-capitalist uh, uh, hierarchies and exclusions. Um, and then correspondingly and, and, con and in contradiction to that, there also is a kind of mythology or philosophy of concrete labor even though we find this, this philosophy uh, uh, most clearly expressed in pre-capitalist writers like, for example, Plato and his idea of everyone having a natural place in the social order, it is still an idea which res is resuscitates again and again with capitalism in the simple sense that uh, it constantly has to create the idea that as long as there are uh, back-breaking jobs, terrible jobs, difficult jobs, there are people who are in some sense destined for those jobs. Um, and these divisions between these different categories and concepts, I think, and this is where I want to kind of end, uh, play two different but overlapping uh, roles. The first is The first is, uh, and here's a quote, and I gave you a little picture of Lucien Sev, uh, that these divisions um, uh, frame the basis of our experience and sense of ourselves. As Sev wrote, this productive activity of men being a social activity is entirely governed by the objective dialectic of social relations. And in this sense, which is that of economic theory, men appear only as a support for economic categories. But on the one hand, being an activity of men, it is also immediately constitutes a fundamental aspect of their individual life process. These are two sides of the same reality. So these divisions and contradictions between abstract and concrete labor are in some sense lived as our experience and that we constantly find ourselves caught between the abstract potential that we think we embody that might make it possible for us to do this or that and the specific concrete job that we're cast into, thrown into at this specific historical moment or moment in our life. 
uh, and the tension between the concrete demands of a specific job and the abstract possibility of engaging in any job is in some sense part of our most intimate biography. I mean, the, the quote was from Lucien Sev's book on, on uh, Marxism and the theory of personality where he argues against any and all sort of appearances that we should understand every economic category that Marx is talking about to have a directly intimate lived dimension. And this should be understood as a theory of not just the economy, but a theory of personality. And then on the flip side of that, you go in the opposite direction. And this is the last uh, point that I want to point that I want to end with. And this is sort of the provocation that, that, um, uh, I want to end with. And this is from a passage in volume three of Capital, where Marx uh, says the following. The specific economic form in which unpaid surplus labor is pumped out of the direct producers determines the relationship of domination and servitude. As this grows directly out of production itself and reacts back on it in turn as a determinant. It is in each case the direct relationship of owners of the production to the immediate producers, a relationship whose particular form naturally corresponds always to a certain level of development of the type and manner of labor, and hence to its social productive power, in which we find the innermost secret, the hidden basis of the entire social edifice, and hence also the political form of the relationship of sovereignty and dependence. In short, the specific form of the state in each case. Um, and this is a very different, I think, formulation from the of the relationship between politics and economics than the one most people are familiar with coming from Marx, which posits there's a base and there's uh, a superstructure. And in some sense, a superstructure rests upon the base. Here, Marx throws out the labor relation itself as a kind of short circuit that directly connects the state and politics to the productive process. And partly what I've been trying to suggest is if we're to understand that short circuit, how we can get directly from the labor process to the political process, I think we have to recognize that internal to the labor process is, are these contradictions of both autonomy and heteronomy, of our ideas of ourselves as self-reliant and our sense of ourselves as dependent of others, but also the contradictions between the alienations and recognition of concrete and abstract labor as a recognition of both abstract equivalence and a recognition of hierarchy and specificity. These are the raw material upon which politics is made out of. Politics is made out of how we understand both our dependence upon others, how we understand our equality with, with others, and how we understand the, the hierarchy with others. And I am arguing, and, and this is all part of a larger thing that I've been working on, that, that we have to understand that our sense of all those things come to us from the labor relation, um, which is why how work is structured, especially in our day and age, how work is structured with and through precarity and vulnerability um, and, and the, the denigration of working conditions has its effect on our ability to imagine and engage in different types of, of politics. That's how I understand the sort of kernel that Marx is referring to there, a kernel that is both incredibly intimate, it's how we, we ourselves are shaped by these contradictions and these contradictions in turn shape how we interact with the world and how politics are shaped. That's, that's my end point. Thank you, uh, Dr. Reed. Uh, we have plenty of time for questions and discussion. Uh, we're a pretty brief, and so uh, I think the best way to proceed is to raise your hand if you have a question. Uh, you can use the, the, the reactions function uh, and uh, that will put you on my radar and I can moderate those questions. If you prefer uh, to type your question into the chat, I'll see that too, and uh, I can make sure that it, uh, it uh, gets vocalized. Uh, so, who wants to start us off? I think uh, if students have questions, uh, it would be great to start with some student questions and concerns. Uh, Colin, 
Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll start with a quick one. So uh, in relation to this idea of abstract and concrete, um, something that we've been talking about in one of my um, PPE classes is the idea of Adam Smith and what he talks about with innovation. So related to this idea of concrete and abstract, um, where does innovation come in, if, if, if that makes sense? Yeah, um, I mean, I think that, that, that first of all, Adam Smith has a very interesting theory of innovation, or at least he has a very interesting anecdote of innovation that I always come back to where Adam Smith talks, this is in the, the beginning chapter of the Wealth of Nations on the division of labor, where he mentions that one of the benefits of the division of labor is by breaking labor down and by positioning a person in front of labor, in front of the same job, that they will see innovations that perhaps engineers might have missed. So he gives the story um, of a little boy who is working on a fire engine and whose job it is is to pull a cord uh, to release a valve of some sort. And he says that this little boy, because he's there, um, uh, uh, notices that the valve he has to pull on happens at the same time that some other mechanism is turned and he can replace his job with a belt, a simple you know, cord or belt replaces his job. And Adam Smith writes about this in an incredibly idyllic way. Um, uh, and the idyllic way is he, he mentions this little boy is gonna be free to go off and play with his friends. And whenever I read that, I always think to myself, mm, I don't, I'm not sure if this little boy had to work on a fire engine Clearly, uh, his family was probably counting on that money in order to be able to uh, make ends meet, and they're gonna, not going to be happy to find out he invented himself out of a job. But that's kind of an aside point. Um, I, I do think that, um, I mean, Smith's main point, I think, is an interesting one, and it is that first you have to divide labor, and then you can automate it. Right. Once you divide labor into smaller portions, it becomes possible to automate it and create new uh, technology. But I think one of the interesting thing, and this is, of course, um, ties into the fact that, that when it comes to hierarchy and division of, of labor, Adam Smith couldn't be further from Plato. In fact, Adam Smith is pretty adamant that um, all little kids are pretty much like all other little kids. Um, they only become different through uh, habit, education, and custom, he says. That if you do something the same day in and day out, you will uh, uh, get better at it. And so what I think is that Adam Smith ties together in his own way, these two different sides of labor I've been talking about, the abstract and the concrete and specific, but Adam Smith ties them together in a, in a fairly um, tumultuous way in the sense that, that he recognizes that people are both going to becoming more adept at doing a, a job because they've done it again and again. Uh, but at the same time, that, that specialization is a very unstable specialization in the sense that um, Sooner or later, that job might be automated or mechanized, and those people will be cast out. So it's not a sort of very static, platonic idea of, you know, some people are just bakers, some people are 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 just farmers, and they'll always be farmers, and that's good. Uh, Smith ties together the idea that people are going to find themselves becoming a thing, and at the same time, that thing can be sort of ripped from underneath them as innovation creates um, uh, new technologies. Um, and, you know, and there are all kinds of ways the implications that play out for Smith, and this is why he needs to talk about education and so forth. Um, but I think that uh, this is the problem that haunted, really haunted Hegel, not so much uh, in the sense that Hegel recognized that, that, um, that we have a new kind of unemployment with with the emergence of capitalism, not the unemployment of 
not having something for people to do, but the unemployment of people who have specialized in doing a particular thing and now find that that thing no longer exists. You no longer need a little boy on the fire engine anymore because that little boy has been replaced by a cord. Um, and I mean, in that case, it's a little boy, so he can probably learn something else. I think what Adam Smith was really worried about is when someone has spent their entire life doing a thing and they're cast out from there. Um, I'm not sure if I totally answered, I mean, I kind of talked about innovation in Adam Smith. I'm not sure if that's completely an answer to your question, um, but it's how I see innovation intersecting with these this, this contradiction between concrete and abstract labor. Um, yeah, no, thank you for that, that was good. Other questions or comments? <laughs> yeah, um, regarding the end of your lecture, you kind of, I guess, ended on a powerful note and asserted that we are kind of, um, we have limited the scope of our reality to only being understood through, I guess, these certain labor relations that has kind of, uh, I guess, degraded ourselves to a limited sense of what is possible and to the point where we're not even able to consider other realities or other ideologies in which we could potentially govern society. And I was just curious if you could, I guess, elaborate on that a little more. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, with, with both sides of the labor relation, both concrete and abstract, I wanted to, to, in talking about these contradictions, I wanted to think of both the good and the bad, right? The good of, uh, the, the, the positive side of concrete labor is the sense of, it is only by focusing on a thing and developing certain uh, potential or abilities that one can do the thing well at all. The negative side is that sense of being reduced to uh, what by definition can only be a limited set of, of, of things, um, of activities, of actions, and even movements, depending on the job, that uh, cannot encompass everything one can do. And similarly, um, when it comes to abstract labor, there's both the, the, what I call the alienation and the recognition or the positive and negative aspects, the negative being um, that no one can be abstractly productive and the demands of abstract productivity kind of uh, work against our finite nature as human beings. And this is not just true for like people who are, you know, working in you know, sweatshops. This is even true of people who have relatively well-paying jobs. I remember uh, not too long ago reading a story about in Silicon Valley, it was all the rage to come up with like the best um, sort of smoothie shake drink because the ideal was people wanted to eliminate meal times from their lives. They wanted to be as, you know, so productive that if they were drinking the right mixture of, you know, kale and protein powder, they wouldn't even need to stop to have a meal. So, you know, this demand of abstract productivity is not just, uh, you know, to be found in Foxconn. It's equally to be found in, in Silicon Valley. Um, and it's a demand which, which to some extent no one can, can uh, live up to, but it has its, its positive or maybe even its, its kind of utopian side as well in the sense that um, it, it, in its own way, it is about the notion that, um, that uh, I mean, even in, 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 in wage labor, the sense that different people can do the same job is a kind of egalitarian notion as well. Um, so, I mean, to me, in terms of how these reduce our reality, we have to look at the way in which um, both these contradictions are, are resolved or um, how they're thought about in any given moment. Is the emphasis on concrete labor as skill or concrete labor as the reduction of oneself to 
a, a very limited sense of skill is the emphasis on abstract labor as a kind of egalitarian ideal or as this impossible productivity for productivity's sake, which doesn't even allow you to stop and have a meal or stop and have a, a, a bathroom break. Thank you. So there's a, a comment in the chat uh, from, um, excuse me, if I get your name wrong, uh, Robert uh, Schmidt uh, says, uh, it seems to me that there are two poles to the labor work construct. One is the Upton Sinclair, the jungle version that Marx talks about. The other is the uh, uh, call it fine French restaurant or new me Toyota GM plant uh, where there's almost uh, or is a partnership between capital management and labor. The latter can give fulfillment to labor if done properly. Professor Reed, do you want to comment on that? Uh, sure. I mean, I think, I mean, I think that, um, you know, partly what I was trying to argue is, is, or, or what I think in general is that there is, um, I mean, I think both sides of this equation, both the concrete and the abstract can be fulfilling um, to use that language or can be the basis of what I refer to as an ethic or a certain kind of recognition in the sense that there is, um, there can be in concrete labor, there can be the pride of uh, uh, completing a job or doing something. And I, and I, as I said briefly in, the, in the, the talk, I do think this is more evenly distributed than people think. I mean, usually people talk about this, this being the craftsman ideal and it's only uh, rele uh, relegated to particular um, jobs where that ideal is firmly in place. But, but if you read, you know, especially discussions with workers in various industries, you know, uh, uh, it's not limited to people who are, you know, doing fine woodworking or whatever. I mean, flight attendants have a sense of what it means to do their job well and get frustrated when the demand of the airline is getting in the way of doing their job well. When the demand to uh, be understaffed, to deal with more customers, et cetera, et cetera, gets in the way of doing what they consider to be a job well done. It's, it's more evenly distributed than we think. And to some extent, uh, I would say similarly when it comes to abstract labor is that there is, um, there is the uh, sense of pride and satisfaction that come from just being actively engaged. Uh, I think that too become, can, in both cases, that pride and satisfaction can be undermined by either the demand to produce more than one can possibly do in a given time, or um, uh, as as abstract as the, the the abstract productivity kind of derails one's sense of satisfaction. Okay, I have uh, started a queue. Uh, I. I... First, want to just open up the floor to student questions uh, before I move on. Uh, student uh, and, and students, you should feel free of jumping in the clue, uh, in the queue uh, after I move on as well. But are there any uh, student questions or remarks right now? Okay, if not, uh, we will move on to the queue. Uh, so I uh, see Robert Kellogg has a question. We don't. Um, is need uh, unmute. Robert, are no, you? I, ha I have a comment. I spent uh, approximately, well, a little over 35 years as an industrial engineer in what you refer to as the sweatshops, the garment industry. And uh, my job was to measure work and put a price on it. So uh, I'm very interested in, in uh, 
the the comments uh, that anybody has here. Uh, I I think uh, uh, I worked for a company that was very successful. Uh, it was a non-union company uh, because of uh, mainly a management uh, approach. Uh, some of the best engineering work I ever did was done by employees who told me what I would do is ask them, what can I do to make your job easier so you can work faster, which is what uh, uh, production was what we were after. And they would tell me, so I'd make their job easier, thus raising production, satisfying them. Generally, they made more money then and uh, management, of course, because they got more production out. Um, so I, I hear what uh, Jason's saying here. I, I, it's very interesting. Okay, thanks. Other comments or questions? Uh, Matt Carlson. Hi, right, thanks. Um, thanks for the talk. Uh, so I hope you'll forgive me if this question is uh, either malformed or too uninformed. Uh, this is far from my area of expertise. <clears throat> but I'm wondering about how this um, account of labor and its value and our alienation or not from it um, applies to some newer forms of labor that are much more common today. And I'm thinking particularly of, um, I don't know, people like YouTube streamers or Twitch streamers, things like that. Because on the one hand, um, it seems like this fits pretty naturally, naturally with a lot of the things that you described, right? Um, you know, they're dependent on various social structures. Like if you're a YouTube streamer, you're dependent on Google and you produce sur surplus value for Google. Um, but on the other hand, uh, you're really not fungible, right? There's something about you in particular that is of the thing that's producing value. Um, and this is sort of connected with the idea that, you know, when you're online, what you're doing is, and you're building your brand, which sounds to me like what you're doing is you're literally selling yourself, right? So again, this is sort of the idea of, you know, your, your own person as the commodity. Um, so I was just curious, uh, Professor Reed, if you had thoughts about any of that. Yeah, I mean, I think it's an interesting um, uh, uh, place to look. I mean, there is, I know that, um, you know, one of the things that comes up about a lot, a lot of these sorts of, you know, uh, work through social media. Um, I mean, one of the interesting things about it is first, there is uh, usually um, a period where people have to have to build up their brand, so to speak, before they can even get any kind of compensation. So there's a, it's like like a almost like a, a quasi kind of internship. There's working for the very possibility of getting work. You have to you know be out there and and put yourself out there in order to um, to even get. Uh, attention necessary for that to become worthwhile. Um, and then there is, I mean, I think one of the difficulties with this kind of labor is it's very difficult to um, think about it's the connection between work done and even uh, wage or some form of income brought in is very ten is sometimes can be, you know, uh, very contingent. Um, and, but it does seem that there's a, a necessary excess of work performed to um, any kind of compensation that comes in. In other words, you have to keep posting and doing stuff in order to, and you get a small, a small amount of that registers and that, that comes back to you. But I do think you're right in the sense that it's, it's another version of concrete labor. It's not the concrete labor of, of having a, a particular skill, 
uh, but it's the concrete labor attached to a particular kind of personality, um, which also gives it a very precarious status because you can cross a particular kind of line. Um, I mean, you can do something uh, uh, that might alienate your viewers or users. And it's not like you can, it's not the same as sort of like losing your job as a skilled worker, like, you know, a skilled say chef or whatever, where you could always just go and appear behind another company. You, you, once you do that, to some extent, you are, um, your personality um, is so integral to the labor you're selling that you can no longer separate your work from your personality. I have a uh, James Ross next, and then Scott Dreher uh, thereafter in the queue. Hi, uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, the I guess the thing that came out to me most vividly in talking about Marx uh, in your talk was uh, I don't think he ever was a, a wage laborer himself, nor a farmer, nor anything like that, because he doesn't seem to really get what's going on uh, when you are a wage laborer or any kind of laborer for that matter. Uh, I, I have, you know, I worked summer jobs when I was in college and uh, was keenly aware of the social aspect of labor within the group of workers themselves, not the relationship of work to the greater society or even to the organization, but rather, I guess you might call it the soci sociology of the workplace and the importance of that is uh, of that to uh, developing one's sense of well-being, one's social status in the hierarchy. Uh, and that same factor is true in the corporation. Uh, I worked in various organizations over the years and the social dimension of work that is your relationships with other people within the organization becomes more and more important as you rise through the hierarchy. This is not news to anybody who's ever been to business school or, or become a manager in a, in a even moderately large corporation. Uh, this is a well-known uh, aspect of organizational life and organizational structure that it seems to me that Marx was completely ignorant of unless you know something in his work uh, that I never encountered. I, it's, uh, <laughs> it's been uh, over 40 years since I was reading any Marx uh, back in my undergraduate days. Uh, but could you address that uh, apparent lack in his grasp of, of what it really means to labor? Well, I mean, uh, in terms of, well, in terms of the social dimension, I mean, I think that um, and part of what I was trying to say, and I think Marx does say this at least, I mean, Marx thinks that to some extent the idea, I mean, part of the, the fiction of a wage as paying an individual for their individual contribution is that Marx thinks that, um, and he talks about this in the chapter in, in Capital on Cooperation, that, um, that work is always more than the sum of its parts, that you bring people together and Mark says, you know, he has this odd passage where he says, like, there are multiple things that are going on. There might be rivalries between people. There might be uh, a sort of shared sense of camaraderie and, and connection. But whatever the case may be, and he's not that interested in, in what the case may be, he thinks that the, the undeniable fact is that a bunch of people working together is always going to have a productivity which is more than the sum of its parts. Um, people do things, are able to do things more in unison with each other they could not do, uh, uh, or they could do independently, but the independent work would never have the same uh, uh, quality or characteristic of work taken uh, together. Um, but of course, you know, and here I think it's interesting to point out that that uh, sort of collective animal spirits, as Marx refers to it, you know, it's very interesting to see that takes on a different definition when you look at someone like 
um, uh, uh, Taylor's principles of scientific management, where he basically says, you know, when you bring a bunch of people together, the thing that happens is not so much an increase of productivity, but a decrease of productivity through their, so through their social sociality, the sense that everyone kind of agrees without even saying it, hey guys, let's not work too hard. Let's all just kind of help each other out and we'll get through this day, right? That, that uh, there's a kind of sense in which collectivity both increases productivity and decreases productivity through the through the kind of communication of of uh, through communication, the fact that people see each other and act accordingly. Um, as far as uh, a the other point, a sense of 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 I mean, I don't think Marx is big on this sort of sense of personal accomplishment in work which is why I turn to other philosophers like Hegel, who has a deeper, richer sense of that. Um, uh, I think that Marx is, you know, more about the alienation. Um, uh, I, but it's interesting to think about where uh, social relations fit in this division between concrete and abstract, um, because it does seem to be concrete, but it's concrete, not specific to an individual, it's concrete, but shared. Um, which is an interesting category to put out there. Dr. Hi there. I just want to uh, uh, introduce my wife, Amy, <laughs> who is actually the one with the question. She just finished reading uh, uh, Love and Capital uh, uh, <laughs> by Ginny Marks. It's that. Have you read Love and Capital? No, I have not. Oh. I know about it, but I've not read it. Um, no, I guess, I don't know if this is so much a question or a comment or com seeking some sort of confirmation of the understanding, but um, I think, you know, we talk a lot about alienation and a lot of questions come up about the individual, but my sense of Marx is that it's more about wage labor so that individuals are naturally productive, they're naturally social, we're naturally sensual, we're naturally all those things, but the, the relations in wage labor, it's that precarity and that vulnerability you spoke to earlier that affects um, our ability to engage in the world and how politics are shaped. And so it's, it's that piece. It's that even if you're fulfilled in your job, that can create a precarity in terms of how you're going to interact politically, how you're going to protect your self-interest in that, in that job, whether or not it's, it's good for the greater good. Right, and so mm -hmm. that's how we tend to reinforce these systems that may be, in, in, in essence, oppressive. But how we get out of those, right? It's either the the exit is um, not as easy as it as maybe it is to reinforce the system as it is if you have a privileged position. And I think that's where we start to look at the intersection of race, and we start looking at all the intersections with capitalism. It's that piece that's so fundamentally important. Yeah, I mean, there's a there's a very interesting passage in in uh, I can figure out which which part of it is, but it's part of the 1844 manuscripts, where Marx talks about the ethics of political economy and the political economy of ethics, and he says that you know that basically, and it's such a dialectical phrase I can't remember which one is which, but but the the ethics of political economy basically tell me that like. That basically ethics is a luxury. First, I have to be, I have to have I have to be able to eat. I have to be able to live before I can do good. And that, and, and Marx uses this phrase like he he says we feel like we're we're judged by two different yardsticks, right? The one yardstick, the one that that political economy uh, puts for us is is basically you have to find a job, you have to do something that is marketable. And that is a necessary condition of having an existence at all. But then once we have an existence, we start asking ourselves questions about like, you know, is this job truly worthwhile? Is this, is this thing I'm doing, it makes money, but I'm not sure it does good in the world. You know, this is uh, uh, to tie into a, a, a recent book uh, by David Graeber, you know, Bullshit Jobs. This, we talked about this, the sense people feel a particular kind of alienation when they feel like the thing they are doing shouldn't even exist, right? Like you're working in a you're working in a call center, cold calling people um, to try to sell them something they don't even want, and it's not the same as you know you know 
say, say being in a job where like, you know, the job, you know, that there's some good you're doing, but you're frustrated with the fact that the, the working conditions make it so you can't really do the thing you want to do, right? You want to make your cook, you want to be a good cook, but they're pushing you to make things quicker and faster. And you realize you're not doing the, the stuff you really want to do. That's a kind of alienation, but I, but, but there's a real alienation that comes from, you know, the sense of in the best of all possible worlds, what I'm doing wouldn't even exist. You know, there wouldn't be a call center uh, calling people, uh, 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 asking them to, you know, extend the warranty on their automobile. Um, uh, and, and that's a very specific kind of, of alienation. Um, and it, it leads to its own specific kind of cynicism, right? Because uh, I think part of what Marx is referring to is that when people feel like ethics is a luxury good, and ethics is kind of a luxury good now. I mean, you, you can, if you have enough money, you can buy a product that uh, uh, a commodity which promises, you know, all kinds of fair trade, safe dolphins, et cetera. Um, but the people who are, who can afford that, uh, it becomes hard not to be cynical about that as well. Um, uh, yeah. So that's a kind. Of, that's a kind of alienation too. I think that's important to think about the alienation of ourselves from our sense of what is right and what we should be doing. Uh, Professor Trott has a final question to take us home. Thank you so much for this rich talk. You've given us a lot to think about, uh, especially the last answer. I think make, gives me more of a sense of having this question. I'm not sure that you have a answer ready to hand, but I wonder what then unalienated labor looks like and the, what the conditions are that would be necessary for that. So maybe the, in a sense that there's a relatively straightforward answer to that, which is about uh, ending a division between necessary and surplus labor. Mm -hmm. uh, but then, then I wonder like, well, what does it look like if labor no longer needs to be exchanged. Like, do we even experience labor in the same way? Like, what is, what is that, whatever we might do to further our living, what does that look like when it's not alienated anymore? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and I feel like, um, I think like a lot of us, uh, I mean, this is, I think a question that comes up for, for people um, like, like you and I and, and other people in this ch chat who um, are fortunate enough to feel a great deal of personal connection and passion for what, the, what they do. Um, and it raises an interesting question of, you know, when are, are, are you know, cause I'm, sometimes I feel like I'm definitely always working, but I definitely feel like there are differences amongst those different types of work. There are times when I'm, you know, if I'm reading this book, am I working right now? I'm, am I, if I'm having this conversation with this student or is it work right now? And there seems to be a point where I would almost want to say, this doesn't feel like work, um, uh, but it's hard for me to, to draw that distinction because, you know, I think everything we do nowadays is under the, the kind of shadow of work as something we exchange in order to get something back that we don't even know how to think about the other activities we engage in. I mean, this is why we use, I mean, I'm, I'm always fascinated by the different uses of the word work. Um, like we talk about homework, we talk about housework, um, but even we taught, we've, you know, work has kind of infused all of our activities. We often talk about, you know, relationships or work. This is work that we that like we don't have a rich vocabulary to think about different activities and constantly try to cram them into this work, non-work vocabulary, which seems inadequate to the variation of the different types of activities that we engage in. Thank you so much, uh, everyone, for joining us this evening. Uh, thank you for those of you uh, in the Wabash community beyond campus uh, for joining us this evening. And please join me now in thanking our speaker, Dr. Jason Ray. Thank you. Good night, everyone. <laughs>